Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you soften our hearts. We pray that you touch our hearts in a special way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, so today we are going to look at a very important subject. Yesterday, I was watching an interview, a documentary actually, about uh, prisoners on death row. And uh, one of those men who were on death row, sentenced to death, you know, he was on death row for many years. And the date for his execution was set. And they asked whether he had any final words. Then he said something that all of us in this room have a death sentence on our lives. I only happen to know mine. It means that many people are walking around as free. But that man knew something which was a blessing to him. He said, I have an opportunity to put my house in order. I had an opportunity to ask for forgiveness. I have an opportunity to make right the wrongs I've done. I have an opportunity to know that tomorrow by this time I won't be alive anymore. And the people I need to ask forgiveness, I'll ask. The people I need to apologize to, I'll apologize. And more importantly, I'll make it right with my God. That touched me in a special way. And it triggered the sermon I'm about to preach today. Bible said in Psalm 90 verse 12 that teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. A certain wisdom comes in when you know we are not here forever. When you know that there is a timeline to what we can do for God. There is, there is a ticking time machine. And you don't have forever to get it right. Yes, we'll make mistakes. Yes, we'll get it wrong sometimes. But you don't have eternity to get it right. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Hebrews 9.27 says that, For it is appointed unto man to die once and after that judgment. We all have an appointment with death. And because of that, we need to get it right as quickly as we can. And one of the things about growing up is that you need to minimize the mistakes. When you are a much younger person, you may be at liberty to make many mistakes. But as you grow up, your mistakes have consequences. They have far-reaching consequences. Sometimes God would forgive you. Many times, not sometimes, God would always forgive you. But the consequences live with you. So that is why we are about to consider the text we are about to consider. And it's from Luke chapter 17 verse 25. I'll read from the New Living Translation. Uh, which says that, But first the Son of Man must suffer terribly and be rejected by this generation. The rejection of Jesus was prophesied. So when you see the nations drive out the Bible out of their school, you know, drive out prayer out of, you know, places of work and things like that, it is a fulfillment of prophecy. I only pray for you that your life will not fulfill evil prophecy. That you in your own life will not reject Jesus. You will not reject his word. You will not reject his church. You will not reject his presence. Out of your actions or inactions, you would not reject God. It is my prayer for you. But Jesus himself was speaking about himself and said, I would be rejected by this generation. I pray you will not be part of the generation that rejects Jesus. Sometimes we think we love Jesus. We think we love him. But when you look at your actions, when you look at the things you do, there is no proof of your acceptance of Jesus. Accepting Jesus goes beyond praying the sinner's prayer and said, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. It is the life we live that shows whether we have accepted him or we are rejecting him. And I pray that your life will be one of that that accepted him and would continue to accept him. Hallelujah. Then he continues to say that when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. Hallelujah. What, what, what is it about a time frame in history called the days of Noah. Who was Noah? The book of Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says that then the Lord saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually and the Lord was sorry that he made man. Wow. Just by the wickedness and the sheer actions of man, the things that people were doing, God said I have regrets, I've created man. But the Bible says something about Noah in the verse 9. It says that Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation, 
Noah walked with God. It means that it is possible to walk with God in all this mess. In the dispensation where Bible says that the thoughts of the hearts of man was continually evil. Bible said that Noah was a perfect man. It means that no matter what your friends are doing, the world is doing, no matter how much you know wickedness there might be, that no matter how much darkness we may have in this world, it is possible to be perfect and just in your generation. And just as Noah defined a generation, that it will be said that it will be said in scripture that just as it was in the days of Noah, it will be said that in the days of Cyril, in the days of Christopher, in the days of Jane, in the days of the day, in the days of Ferdinand, in the days of Albert, there should be something about your life that defines a generation that you can become a reference point to God that wickedness and darkness would be on the face of the earth but you would be light oh you didn't hear that I'm saying that you would be light enough that you become a reference point as Noah so Jesus who would live many years after Noah would come on the scene and say just as it was in the days of Noah just as it was in the days of Albert there should be something about my life it might be prayer it might be soul winning it might be love it might be kindness that I become a reference point that God will say that in the days of Albert the world saw kindness in the days of Cyril the world saw intercession in the days of Jane the world saw worship hallelujah in the days of Noah in the days of Noah the people enjoyed banquets I'm reading from the New Living Translation and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat and the flood came and destroyed them all and the world would be as it was in the days of Lot people went about their daily businesses eating, drinking, buying, selling farming and building until the morning Lot, Lot left Sodom. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes, it would be business as usual right up unto the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It would be business as usual. Tomorrow is Monday. We'll go for lectures. Uh, the doctors here would go to work. The business people would go to their businesses. The Bible says that it would be business as usual. It would be business. As, I pray that your life would not be business as usual. You would find purpose to life. It would not, oh, we are going to class. Oh, we are going to work. Oh, we are going for lunch. We are going for dinner. You would understand that we don't have forever to do this thing. There is something that needs to be done. There is an answer that your life needs to provide for a question that exists in this world. And I pray that your life will not be business as usual. From today, it will not be the many things you have to do. It will be the one thing you need to do. Bible says that, Mary, is it matter? You are worried about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has found it, and it shall not be taken away from her. Have you found that one thing, or you are worrying about the many things that need to be done? How to pass your MBCHB exams, how to pass your ACC exams, how to get married, what to eat, which area of town you can live in, where to work, whether to travel to America whatever the worries are, they might be relevant, but Bible says that one thing is needful and Mary has found it and it shall not be taken away from her then I'll finish the scripture then we start the sermon, it says on that day yes, it will be a business as usual right to the day when the son of man is revealed, on that day a person out on the deck of the roof must not come down into the house to pack a person out of the field must not return home Remember Lord's wife. Remember Lord's wife. What is it about Lord's wife that is worth remembering? Jesus didn't say remember the chariots of Elijah. Jesus didn't say remember the wisdom of Solomon. Jesus didn't say remember the revelations of Moses. Jesus didn't say remember the encounters of Jacob. Jesus didn't say remember the leadership of Joshua. Jesus didn't say, remember the strength of something. He said, remember Lot's wife. And whenever you are told to remember something, it means that you are likely going to forget this thing. If you are going for an exam and the lecturer says, remember this one, it means that this is something you are likely not going to pay attention to. And he is bringing your attention to something which is critical. I pray for us that the important things we will not forget. 
remember Lot's wife. What is it about Lot's wife which is worth remembering for this generation? Sometimes we set good examples and look at Bright. He is studious. Look at Patron Ferdinand. He sponsors the knees of the church. Hallelujah. That's a good example. But others also become bad examples. Even a bad example can be a reference point. Have you seen the alcoholic? Don't be like him. Have you seen how that man wasted his life? Don't be like him. That is why the Bible was written in the way it was written. Because, you see, God did not hide the weaknesses of the men he used. If, if you ever attended a funeral and you hear the tributes of thieves read, you would think they were bishops. Because we human beings, we are like that. When you attend, any funeral is like a celebration galore. Oh, beautiful mother, how we love you. But some of those mothers left their children. Some of those fathers never took care of their families. But when you hear their tributes read, you think they were the most perfect. I don't know whether you are getting, but God is no man. So when God was writing about the life of great men and women he used on the surface of the earth, he was careful to include their weaknesses, their faults, their shortcomings, to make you understand that it is not only the strengths that makes a man. Oh, hallelujah. It is not only the highs that make people. The lows also make them. So today, if you are seated here and you have some lows, don't judge yourself and keep yourself down because you've made mistakes. Because Abraham that we've come to know as the father of faith, he lied to the face of God. Elijah, as we know, who called fire from heaven. He was running away from Jezebel and was asking God to kill him because of Jezebel. Moses, as we know, he married a foreigner when God told them not to marry any foreigner. David, as we know, he committed murder and married another man's wife and had children with him. The point or the catch here is that it's not the mistakes the men made, but how they dealt with those mistakes. You see, David came back to God. He made a genuine mistake. He killed someone's husband, married the woman, slept with the woman. There were consequences of that act, but he came right to the presence of God. And God restored him. Hallelujah. Solomon, as we know, came from David's mistake. The wisest man that will ever live on earth came from a man's mistake. It means that even in your mistakes and your downfalls, if you can run back to God, he makes something beautiful out of it. So Jesus was speaking to this crowd about the end times and about the judgment of God. And he says that the example I will give to you is to go back and study the life of Lord's wife. Remember Lord's wife. I pray none of us would ever forget this woman. So we go back to the book of um, Genesis, hallelujah. Genesis chapter 19, verse 12 to 17. And then we jump to 26. So this is the life of, you know, Lot and the wife and the family. He says that then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? When God came to Sodom to destroy the city because of their wickedness, the Bible said God sent angels to the family of Lot. God sent a special delegation to the home of Lot. And so these are the angels speaking. Genesis chapter 19, verse 12. He says that, Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city? Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But his sons-in-law seemed, but to his son-in-laws he seemed to be joking. When we are preaching to turn away from God, sometimes it looks like we are joking. It looks like we don't have anything doing with our time. When we say, oh, the church is praying from 11 to 12, it looks like, oh, they, they have extra time to waste. When we are given an instruction, sometimes the instructions of God would come in the form of something that you can easily trivialize. Lot went to his son-in-laws and told them that, listen, we must back out of this city. The Bible said that, oh, to them, he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, 
the man took hold of his hand his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters and the lord being merciful to him they brought him out and set him outside the city some of you god has to come and drag you out of some things because normal advice hasn't stopped you we've come to tell you that god is about to destroy this city but because of how bright the sun was shining that day you say nothing will happen oh look at the world the world is beautiful look at the flowers oh nice things are happening in this world there will be no judgment god, god loves the world is that not what people say god loves the world no, nobody will be judged how can a loving god judge people how can a loving god send people to hell if there was no hell jesus wouldn't preach about it if there was no punishment for sin it will not be in the bible and a loving God never sent anybody to hell. It is people who rejected the love of a loving God because he gave a lifeline. It is the hardness of the heart of men that take them to hell. A loving God, the hell was not made for man. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. But because man went after the devil and fell with the devil, that is why it looks like man would go to hell. But really, God didn't make hell for anyone. So if you are listening to me today, when we are talking about heaven and hell, it is not like God wanted any of us to go to hell or God wants to punish anybody by going to hell. It is because we went after the example of the devil. And that's why a thing like hell would be a reality for a people. Bible said they lingered and the angels went to drag her Lord's wife Lord himself his sons in law out of the city I pray that some of you God will drag you out of certain things that are holding you back because you see they just went to live there for some few years that's what Pastor Chris was saying this morning by the time they realized they were they owned properties in, in, in Sodom they had things that they were attached to so it was not easy for them to move out of this city anymore it was not an easy thing for them to run out because now you are looking at the land you owe you are looking at the properties you have you are looking at the cattle you have you are looking at all the families you have established all the friends you have it is not easy to now run out of sin because you have now become comfortable in your sins i pray for you that none of us would find comfort oh i'm saying that you will not find comfort in sin you know, one of the gifts God would ever give a man is discomfort in sin. You see, a, a, a goat, or let, 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 let's give this example. A sheep may fall in mud. The sheep would cry. The sheep would shake himself. The sheep would look for salvation. But a pig would be dancing, would be wallowing in that mud. That's the difference. The difference is the nature. It is not like we don't fall in mud sometimes. No, we fall in mud. But because what God has put on the inside, the nature he has put on the inside, would not stay in that mud. When we fall in it, we are not comfortable in it. It is dangerous to be fornicating and be comfortable in it. There should be something that tells you that, no, you don't belong here. You may do it, but this is not you. It is a good thing to be in some... You see, sometimes when your conscience becomes seared, you now do it and you don't feel anything. Normally, when you start doing something wrong, you do it and you feel bad about it. I shouldn't have done this. You are remorseful. You feel bad. But if you linger doing it, now you can even do it and you don't even re realize it's wrong. You start justifying it. You start explaining it. You start saying why it should be done and why it's normal for everyone to do. I pray for those people who have become comfortable in any sin. It can be an addiction. It can be a fault. It can be a weakness. But you see, even if that weakness exists, don't be comfortable there. Because the only hope you can struggle out is the fact that you are not comfortable in Sodom and Gomorrah. You are not comfortable. You might live there because that's where you live. But you are not comfortable in the mess. So the Bible said it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. Escape. Run for your life. I'm telling you, there are some things that look like a little lie, but I tell you, run for your life. There are some things that look like comforting places. They bring pleasure, but run for your life. The devil is coming for the kill. He is not playing. He is not joking. It looks like a little weakness, but if you don't run for your life, it will destroy you. There are things that have destroyed marriages. They started small. When they started, no one ever woke up and said, I want to destroy my marriage. No one woke up one day and says, I want to destroy my businesses. 
No one woke up one day and said, I want to destroy my children. But people do these things anyway. People destroy their children. People destroy their businesses, destroy their marriages. From the little decisions, they don't stop. From the little things that people do that they don't confront. Some of you should get out of this place today and confront spiritual laziness. Confront it. You have stayed there for too long. You have found excuses there too long and you are now comfortable. Be uncomfortable not coming to church. Don't find an excuse. Some of you, nothing happens to you when you are not where the church is meeting. Let's say the church is praying and I'm not there. Hey, I'll be uncomfortable till I join. What's happening? Not because I'm a pastor. It happened way before I became a pastor. Whenever I'm supposed to be at a place and I'm not there, I'm worried. What's happening there? Is there something happening I'm not aware of? Run for your life. Run for anything that doesn't look like God. It may not look like death, but run for your life. It may look smooth, but run for your life. Because that little thing, if you don't deal with it, will destroy everything you have spent your life to build. I'll jump to the verse 23. It says that the sun had risen upon the earth. So yes, the city was destroyed. The Bible said God rained down upon the city fire and brimstone after Lot and his family left the place. And the Bible says his wife looked back and became what? A pillar of salt. So what is it about this story? I don't want to go because it's a very long scripture and we don't have time. So that's why I paraphrase the rest. So from 20 to 23 to 26, you know, 26 said that, but his wife looked back uh, behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So God told them, don't look back. Run for your life. Get out of this city. But the wife disobeyed and looked back and became a pillar of salt. So Jesus is saying that, remember this woman. What is it about her that we need to remember? Point one. Remember that she perished although she was a woman of great privilege. This was a woman who married the man of her dreams. You don't get it. This was a woman who married a very successful man. Lot was a successful man. In fact, Abraham divided land with Lot. Abraham chose this side, Lot chose the other side. I don't know whether you are getting me. This was someone who was dividing inheritance with Abraham. How many people have such privilege? To be married to a man who had land, who had cattle, who was rich, and more importantly, connected to Abraham. When God called Abraham to move out of his parents' home, the one person he called was Lot. Lot was beyond his nephew. Lot was like a friend to Abraham. Lot was connected to power. I don't know whether you are getting me. If it was political power, Lot was connected right at the top. So this woman married the man of her dreams. She also was privileged that when God was about to destroy the city, she had angels visiting her. How many people had encounters with angels? Ah! An angel was released specially to come and speak to her. She perished although she had access to the word of God. God himself came to speak to her. Some of us have access to the word of God. We are in the best church. She was in the best church. The church of Abraham. But we don't get it. She had the best pastor. Just like Judas. Judas had the best pastor in the best church. Connected to Jesus himself but perished. How could you perish? Being connected to the, to the best man you can be connected to. How can you? How is it possible? It means that there are people who will be connected to spiritual things but still perish. There are people who come to church every Sunday and perish. Because she just didn't come to church. She was connected to Abraham at the top. She had privilege. And many of us are people of great privilege. Have the honor to be preached to by an angel. An angel brought the word of God to them. You see, the reason why God has stopped you know, showing himself anyhow to people is that even when God was in the wilderness with the with the Israelites, they were seen, you know. There was a cloud above them. There was, a, there was one behind, there was one on top. When God was in the wilderness, they were fornicating under the cloud. 
The reason why people are fornicating is not because God is absent. When God was in the wilderness with them, you just need to look out. You just look out of the window. There were no windows, Kra. It was a wilderness. So just look up. You will see God in a pillar above you. People were fornicating. People were lying under that cloud. So the reason why you are in sin is not because you've not seen God. It's not because you've not had any encounter with any angel. You are the day I'll have an encounter with Jesus. I'll change. Listen. Bible said that Jesus was that rock that followed them in the wilderness. The rock that gave them. Jesus was in the wilderness with them. God was in the wilderness with them. The Holy Spirit was in that wilderness with them. Bible said the glory of God was upon that tabernacle. 24-7. They saw fire on top of that tabernacle. They were still sinning. It means that you can have access to all these things and still perish. The men and women who left Egypt perished in the wilderness although they saw God in that wilderness. They heard the voice of God speak from the mountain. They saw the mountain shake. They saw the glory. They saw Moses' face and still perished. The things you are looking for, that's not what takes you away from sin. The church is looking for encounters now. They saw the miracles in the wilderness. They saw manna rain down from heaven. God brought meat. When they complain about the manna, now God brought quails from the sea and blew it into the camp. That he said, now have meat and eat. Miracles. When they were beaten with snakes, the Bible said that you know, Moses hung the snake and as many that saw the snake were healed. There were miracles in that wilderness. But they still perish. The reason why people are perishing is not a lack of miracles. The reason why people are perishing is not a lack of the voice of God. The voice of God is right in this dispensation. It is not even a lack of the presence of God. The presence of God is in this church. So ask your neighbor, how can you still perish? How? How is it possible that you can still perish? In the midst of all these privileges that we are in a dispensation where we have the Bible on our iPhones, our iPads, our Android phones, on the internet, wherever you go, the Bible is there. When you go to YouTube, the word of God is preached. The apostles have risen. But what sin do we see in this generation? Sin is on the increasing when we now have access to God and His Word. How is that possible? Jesus is saying, Remember Lord's wife because she had all these privileges and still perish. I pray that those of us who are people of privilege will not, would not perish because Jesus Himself said, In that day, many will say, We prophesied in your name. How many people will ever have the, the privilege to prophesy? Pastor Chris, are you getting one? How many prophets do we have? We can virtually count them like people who can come and say, that's here is the Lord and it comes to pass. How many? It says that day, many will say, many will say, we prophesied in your name. We healed the sick in your name. How many people healed the sick? I don't know whether you are getting How many people have such powers to lay hands on the sick and they are healed? How many people have that? Not many. So we healed the sick in your name. Then he said, we raised the dead in your name. How many people do you see who have power enough to pray for the dead and they are raised from the dead? It means that these are privileged people. Privileged people who were trusted with power. They were trusted with the presence of God that they could pray for the dead and the dead are raised. The Bible will say that. He said in that day they will say we, we prophesied in your name. Heal the sick in your name. Raise the dead in your name. And I will say I know you not. Ye workers of iniquity. So how can you have all these privileges and still perish and still be a worker of iniquity? How is it possible? Remember Lot's wife because she perished although she was a woman of great privilege. One day we might marry the women of our dreams or the men of our dreams. We may start the companies we want to start. Our families will live in the parts of town we want them to live. We may start business empires and we may become successful. But I pray that with all these privileges, we would not perish. America has become successful. Europe has become successful. They are developed. We have gone to space. But with all the privilege that they were trusted with, the wisdom that God trusted with them, they have perished despite the privileges. I pray that your privileges won't move you away from God. The blessings of God won't take you away from Him. Some people become blessed now. Sunday mornings they play golf. Yes. The blessings of God. Oh. The blessings of God. Some people become CEO of companies. Now CEO is now sleeping with girls. Before jobs are given. 
you have not come to a place of power you are now abusing the blessing that you prayed for you prayed to get this job you now have the job and you are complaining you prayed to get medical school you are now here and you won't study you won't study you sleep and watch movies oh hallelujah I'm going to preach this message I pray that the privileges and the blessings won't take away uh, the, the love we are supposed to have for God that you raise the dead heal the sick open blinded eyes and still perish how is it possible Lot's wife perished although she was a woman of great privilege Point two. She perished although she had clear sign of danger. She had a clear sign of danger. How many people in Sodom were warned? But she had access to the warning that God is about to destroy this city. It would be, it would be a disaster for someone in church to perish. Because we know about heaven. Sometimes it's okay for the world to perish because they don't know about hell. They don't know about all the worms that eat and all the fire, the bottomless pit, the judge. They don't know about all these things, all these technicalities. But someone who is sitting under the, 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 the sound of my voice, how can you perish when you have a clear sign that this line you are lying, it is destroying you. This weakness you are toying with is destroying you. How can you perish although you have a clear sign of danger? How can you perish although the Holy Spirit was telling you this guy is not good for you? But you said we love the red flags. We are every men and women. We love the color red. No, 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 no. We love red. When the red flags are there, you find excuses for them. Followed Botos. The warning signs were on the wall. <laughs> she perished, although she had a clear warning, a clear sign of danger. It was the danger. You say we love danger. Don't we love danger? There was a sign about the danger. Don't go ahead. You say oh, we love danger. We we'll manage the danger. We we'll manage it. God will take care of us. She perished, although she had a clear warning of danger, or a clear sign of danger. And normally, when I get here, I always read this story about Charlie Peace. You know, who was a a thief, stole many people's things killed many people and he was also on death row going to die so the morning of his execution it's on google so you can google his name and read he says that on the morning of his execution peace ate a hearty breakfast of eggs and salty bacon tell you have to live in certain countries the day you're about to die they still have an english breakfast for you hey wow how's that cooking <laughs> Even if you are going to die, at least eat some scrambled eggs with sausages and bacon. Oh, Philip, is it not is it not only right that the day you are about to die, I pray for you that you will not just grow up in country. See, there are people who wish to be prisoners in countries than to be free in their own country because there is not. Someone was saying that I was hearing some two guys argue that today if a ship comes to Jamestown that people should come on it and be slaves in America the queue would, would go beyond a tenter no we are not we are not trivializing slavery but people are in bondage in their own country than they would be why do you think people go through uh, 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 this desert crap? People walk through the Sahara Desert and die every day. But someone says, I would rather attempt it. I was watching a CNN documentary and some of the men who 
were caught on the desert because there are desert patrols and there is no water on the desert and things like that. He said, I would rather try. You see, we will not die poor. We will die trying. Like you guys. Charlie Peas ate eggs and salty bacon and calmly awaited the coming of the public executioner, William Marwood, inventor of the long drop. He was escorted on the death walk by the prison chaplain who was reading aloud from the consolation of religion about the fires of hell. Charlie Peace burst out, say, if I believe what you and the Church of England say you believe, even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it, if need be, on hands and knees and think it worthy just to save one soul from going to an eternal place like that. The prison chaplain was reading about hell because normally when they're about to die, they read to them about heaven and hell and give them an opportunity to give their lives to Christ before they die. And the chaplain was just stood there and heaven and hell and, and the prisoner said, the place you are talking about that the fires don't quench a place of torment if I believe what you and the church of England say you believe about the Bible I would walk on broken glasses from coast to coast to save one soul from going to a place like that someone on death row was a missionary more than a pastor a prison chaplain who was casually reading the word of God how can you be reading this and not tremble? I don't know whether you are getting me. It's because we truly don't believe the word of God. We don't believe that when the Bible talks about hell, is there is a place like that. We don't believe that when people die, there is no opportunity for them again. That is why even on the hospital world, we don't preach to our patients. I'm telling you. That's why we don't preach to our family members. That's why sometimes our friends misbehave. We know they are misbehaving, but we can't tell them. It's because we think that this thing is a joke. Charlie Peace was telling the prison chaplain that if I believe what you and the Church of England say you believe, if the things you are reading in the Bible are true, then it is worth it to walk on broken glasses and save one soul from going to a place like that. This is not a parable. This is not one of the stories. I read the name, Charlie Peace also read William Maud, who was the execution, the one who was going to kill him that morning. He said, you are reading about a place like hell this casually. You are not trembling at the word of God. You know why we continue in sin? It's because we don't really believe that there is a judgment of God. We don't believe what God says about sin. And that's why we keep on toying with it. That's why we keep on playing. We keep on saying, oh, this is just a weakness. You know, yeah, it's a weakness. We understand people have weaknesses. But I'm saying that your, your orientation about sin will change the day you believe the Bible. The day you truly believe that the things the Bible says are true. That day, you realize that your approach, your disposition to sin will change. And I pray for us. That we will not casually read the word of God. When we open the Bible to read, we would, we would believe the things it says. Pastor Chris has been preaching about soul winning and things like that. You know, we've been pressing people and things like that. Do you know why people don't pray? It's because they don't believe what the Bible says about our warfare. They don't believe what the Bible says that men ought to pray and not to faint. It's because they found an agency outside God. They found a way to live. And they think that things will continue like it has been. This woman perished although there was a clear sign of danger. The word of God has told us there is danger. But I'm sure she did not believe that there will be consequences if she looks back. So she was trying it. You know, you've tried it for many years. There are no consequences. But there is a day coming. There is a day coming. There is a day coming. See, one of the things that none of you in this church can ever say is that I have not ceased to proclaim unto you the full counsel of God. You cannot say that I have not warned you. On the judgment day, I will say like Paul said, I am, I am not guilty of the blood of men, for I have declared unto you the whole counsel of God. Who in this church can say I have not preached about sin? If there is something you hear over and over again, it is this. 
you have been warned over and over and over and over again the other thing is whether you believe in the warnings whether you believe they said reptiles crocodiles in this river you said we want to swim <laughs> the purpose of danger danger signs is to warn people who are about to go ahead I pray for us that God will give us discernment and some of you before you enter relationships you will see the boom red boom 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 yesterday I watched a funny video on the internet there was a guy who went to stand by a, a, a reptile or one of those animals in a zoo somewhere and they wrote venomous you know, like this is a venomous snake or a venomous animal then he stood and said oh venomous instead of saying venomous like he's mentioning it as a sweet name oh venomous and he was playing with the animal playing with the animal God has said danger but that is the terrain we want to play that is where we want to transact our business dangerous waters you said no we are skillful scalers no we, we don't play in the little leagues we play in the champions league I pray for professionals the danger of sin the danger of sin number three She perished although she made some efforts at salvation. You know, this woman didn't die in Sodom and Gomorrah. She, she left Sodom and Gomorrah. She left. She even climbed the mountain. So this was someone who was totally disobedient. This was someone who made some efforts. This was someone who at least, you know, carried some things, moved with their family and all that. But she perished nonetheless. Some of us justify us. No, we are not bad people. Though. Have we we come to church? Ask your neighbor, am I not here? Or ask your neighbor, am I not here? Haven't I made, I woke up this morning, I ironed my dress, I took my bath. I've, I've, I've tried. Tell my neighbor, I've tried. Tell, tell your neighbor, I've tried. Haven't I tried? Ask your neighbor, haven't I tried? Ah, the prayer is not like we've not prayed. We've prayed some. It's not like we've not attended any meeting. We've come for some she made some efforts at salvation she moved from the city she climbed the mountain before she perished it means that it is possible to perish although you've made some efforts so we are trying god knows we are trying we are doing our best whatever you are telling yourself may be true but i'm telling you bible said jesus said remember lord's wife remember that she perished although she made some efforts at salvation sometimes the efforts we appreciate them but they are not good enough we know you are trying but the, the agenda is not to try the agenda is to escape to escape Sodom and Gomorrah and to be fully obedient to God I know you have made certain efforts I know you have prayed I know you have the church is fasting 21 days and you do one day 6 to 6 to 8 a.m. Say so we've tried. Haven't we tried? We appreciate your efforts. But there, there is a purpose for God calling you out of this city. And until that is fulfilled, the efforts don't mean anything. You see, we, we are people who celebrate efforts and not results. Yeah, we are a generation effort. So you realize that there, there is prayer everywhere. But where are the answers to prayer? What are we? I don't know whether you are getting me. We are not a people who have respect for results. So, so then I say, I'm learning. It's not about learning. You have to pass your exams. We appreciate your studies. But there is a purpose for the studies. There is a reason why you are studying. So if that purpose is not achieved, even if you study for 15 hours, there are students who sleep in the study. I remember those days when we were in medical school. There was this lady who stayed in the reading room like 24 7 she 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 slept there every day great effort sometimes we are even impressed with the effort but it's the result we are looking for what's the point in sleeping in a steady room if you come out with f in chains if you make a necklace out of f's 
bars. You know? So we'll rather appreciate someone who spent an hour and passed, right? Because there is a purpose to this. You spent the whole night. I remember one of the medical school exams I was invigilating. They asked one of the students a, a question. She couldn't answer. They asked another one. She couldn't ask another one. Started crying. They said, I studied. Say I studied. Say I studied. Started crying. Say, I, studied. I read this. I read this. Say, I so so answer. You can't remember what you read. There is no way we can establish you learned it. We must become a result oriented people. There is no point in coming to church and living unholy lives. There is no point praying when we are going to continue in our sins. I would say that do we continue in sin for grace to abound? Certainly not. How can we, who have been saved from sin, continue to live the rain? It is not possible. We, there, there should be results of why you've come to church. There should be something to show for why we came here. If we are going to continue living in our sins, we've wasted our coming here. I don't know whether you are getting me. I pray that from today you begin to see the results. You will not just be an effort person. Oh, we prophesied in your name. We healed the sick in your name. We raised the dead in your name. Then you will still perish. No. I pray that from today when you pray, you have answers to your prayers. I pray from today when you come to church, you've not wasted your time. There will be something tangible in your life you can point to. That I got this from the presence of God. When you read your Bible in the morning, it will not be like a storybook. You would have encounters with God. We will not just celebrate efforts. We will celebrate results. Remember Lot's wife because she was a picture of disobedience and rebellion. Remember that there are consequences to disobedience. See, obedience protects you. When an instruction is given, you have been, you know, when they say, oh, before you set a line for a patient, wear gloves. You can decide not to wear gloves. Do you got what I'm saying? But when you have needle breaks and blood pours on you from an HIV patient, then you understand that that instruction was not to restrict you it was to protect you look at the laws of God which of them are supposed to bound us knowing the things we know now about sin about if we never knew about STIs would we still think it's worthy to, to like like to obey God I don't know whether you are getting me now science is advanced enough for us to know that oh there are sexually transmitted infections if we didn't know that they existed, would we just have accepted God's instruction that do not fornicate or commit adultery? Sometimes we are waiting to see the consequences before we obey. We are waiting to see certain consequences before we hear what God is saying. Listen, there are some consequences. Your life is too small to experience it before you learn. I had a lady who told me who had HIV. She had sex once. I remember that lady. She was in Lincoln Hall and XP. About 15 years ago. I met her. She was a virgin. Visited a friend from SHS. He had sex. She had HIV and was pregnant. She said, what's off it happened once. There are some things people will toy with. Yes, nothing will happen. You try it and see. There's a thing people will do and get away with it. But when you do it, there are consequences. That's why you don't say, oh, this thing will be... There are some things you can do for 20 years. In the 21st year, try it and see. Disobedience has consequences. I pray that none of us will continue in disobedience. The things you know you would have the power to do. The number five is that she perished although she committed one sin. She just looked back. Also for Chris, is it is it deep? How does looking back generate any problem? Like, who am I offending? Have you ever heard the argument of LGBT? Like, you know, I mean, like I'm doing something in my room. Who have I done it? Like, I've not 
killed anybody? Have I, have I killed you? Have I done anything to anybody? How does this disturb society when I'm in my room doing something? Science is still trying to understand the e effects of certain things on the body. It means that 50 years ago we did not understand certain effects. There is something that God knows about sin that we don't know. There is something that God knows about lies that we don't know. And the proof that we don't know is because we are still continuing in it, although it's dangerous waters. Let's read the scripture. Yeah, I think with Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says that but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. Sin throws a bait. It is deceitful. It's like a bait which is thrown. The bait has fish on it, but in that fish is a hook. Sin is deceitful. It comes in, you know, ah, this one is not deep. Like there are no strings attached. But when it catches you, that's when you realize that it is coming for the kill. Lest any of us be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. James chapter 1 verse 14 says that but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and entice. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. So it only starts as a desire. So today I want you to look at your desires. The things you desire. Also, for do you know we could be desiring God? While some people are desiring alcohol, desiring sex, desiring pornography, desiring this thing. All, see, your desires are like the starting place of a catalytic equation. Once the desire comes, it's either righteousness or sin, which is the end of it. We may not see desires like that. Or oh, a desire to watch a movie, desire for entertainment. It may not be a bad desire, but it has an end goal. You see, it starts as desires. And when they are mature, they bring forth sin. And when sin is fully matured, it is death that is bringing. She perished although she committed one sin. Lot's wife perished although she just looked back just you may say oh it's just this one or oh, it's just a little line i was under pressure so i had to lie you don't have an idea what that one lie has done to your soul you don't know how it has corrupted you you don't understand how that one sex changed everything i met a lady who had sex with a guy since then in her dreams snakes would come and have sex with her Think her life changed like her life changed like see now in the night she has to call me on phone you don't understand that this nicely dressed gentleman with a, a Jojo Armani perfume or a Givenchy or, or call some of them what are the expensive Philip you can help me Pastor Chris, Jane, <laughs> Apochi, is the way you wear Apochi, you know, when you wash the dress, about 10 times it's still inside, Apochi perfume. It's just one action, but you have no idea, you have no idea, you have no idea, you have no idea. And the people have ended their lives so through little actions that nobody knew about. We're all there when Kirk Franklin spoke about how pornography nearly destroyed his marriage. It comes in harmless, but by the time you realize, you see the effects in areas you don't want to see the effects. The last thing I want us to talk about before we leave here is that she was saved from Sodom and Gomorrah but didn't make it into the rest of God yeah. she was saved from Sodom she didn't perish in Sodom it was just like the Israelites in Egypt they were saved from Egypt but they died in the wilderness they never entered Canaan 
And that's what the devil... The devil is not... He's not offended at all when you are saved from the world. What he doesn't want to happen is for you to enter the rest of God. For you to truly be saved from sin. So he wants you to be saved from Egypt and be living in sin in the wilderness. Be fornicating. So people are celebrating, oh, we are believers. We are Christians. We've been saved from the world. We, you have been saved from the world and living like the world in the church. Ah, they left Egypt to bad. Their taste buds didn't lift Egypt. Bible said that they crave for the spices of Egypt. They were in the wilderness. Bible said they ate manna, which was the food of angels. But because they were so used to the spices of Egypt, how can you reject the food of angels? Bible said that manna. Their clothes didn't wear off because they ate that spiritual food. But they desired something physical. The devil has no problems you being saved from Egypt. The main agenda is to make sure you don't make it into Canaan. So some of us are celebrating. We are not unbelievers. Yes, we know. We are not sinners. We are not in Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, we've been dragged out of it. Because remember, it was by the grace of God they were taken out. They didn't want to go. But Bible said the angels held their hands and dragged them out of the city. So yes, they've been saved by grace. Being saved. We were saved by grace. We are being saved and we would be saved. We are being saved. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But I thought you were saved by grace. So which salvation are you working again with fear and trembling? The salvation of your mind. You are saved. The spirit man is saved by grace. No, no works. But we are being saved until the Lord will come and we will be saved when we are given new bodies. She did not make it into the rest of God. There is a rest of God for your health. There is a rest of God for your prosperity. There is a rest of God for your freedom. The devil doesn't mind you sitting in church once you are still bound in your sins. He doesn't mind you coming to church every Sunday if you go back after church and continue in your sins. So you have been saved from the world, but the world has not. You see, they were saved from Egypt, but Egypt was not taken out of them. I pray for us that we would make it into that promised land. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 says that therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear. The only part of Bible that it says you should fear, it says let us fear. There remains a promise of entering the rest of God. Uh, what's the name? Kekeli. There remains a promise of entry. There is a perfect, there is a place God will want you to be. That's the rest of God. And until we enter that place, don't allow sin, don't allow disobedience, don't allow whatever is trying to trap you, prevent you from living God's best for your life. Be on your feet with me. Be on your feet with me. Remember Lot's wife because she was saved from Sodom and Gomorrah but did not make it into the rest of God. I know you have been saved from the world you are a Christian but have you entered his rest? Have you entered his rest? He says let us fear lest we come short of it since there remains a promise. Cyril there is a promise. Ferdinand there is a promise of entering his rest. What you see now is not the rest of God. Sometimes being saved from Egypt looks like the job is completed. No. There is a rest of God. There is a rest of God. And I pray for everyone standing here this morning. That we will just not celebrate salvation from the world. We will celebrate entering the rest of God. We will celebrate entering dominion. We will celebrate entering the wisdom of God. We will celebrate entering true freedom. Where we are not bound in the church. I want you to lift up your voice and pray for a minute for yourself. I don't know what you heard, but Jesus told them, Remember Lord's wife. Remember, you have great privilege. You want to pray that God, I will not perish with all the privilege I have, all the messages I've heard, all the encounters I've had, all the prophets who have preached to me. The pastors who have pastored me. How can I perish? How can a person perish? After prophesying in his name. After healing the sick in his name. After raising the dead in his name. 
how can you perish you want to pray and say father help us enter your rest the agenda is to enter the rest of God you want to say that since there remains a promise of entering true freedom may we enter your rest may we enter your perfect will for our life there is a will of God concerning your life there is a purpose of God concerning your life I pray for you that you would enter the rest of God in the name of Jesus we would not be set off that we were workers of iniquity after we've raised the dead after we've prophesied in his name we would not perish in the best church it would not be said of us as it was said of Judas he walked with Jesus he was in every service he heard all the sermons preached he was on the mountain when the beatitudes were said he was at the last supper when the covenant was established the new covenant was established at that last supper Judas was there Judas at that last communion but he still hung himself he still perished because he kept on playing with sin I pray that none of us will keep on playing with sin may God help our weaknesses your generations will not perish just as it was said about Noah Noah was perfect in his generation and he was a righteous man in a generation that was perverse in a generation filled with darkness Noah walked with God I pray that you would walk with God with all this darkness in this world you would walk with God in the name of Jesus Father we pray I want us to pray a last prayer before we leave here let me tell you something if you are struggling with any form of sin anything that takes you away from God eh? willpower doesn't stop any habits I'm telling you in the history of habits willpower never saved any man how many people have ever done something you are not proud of I will lift up my two hands in, with my feet you felt like you did better I pray that God would give you grace yes it's the grace of God that saves people from sin it's a grace that breaks boundaries. It's a grace that, you see, whatever chains that anyone may be in today, no matter how many years you've been struggling, some people have struggled for 20 years, some people have struggled for 30 years, some people have struggled for uh, uh, 35 years. How many, I don't care how many years it has been. If you are in chains, you need someone to open the chains. So today, may Jesus open chains. Chains that have bound men your best efforts have failed guilt couldn't help you feeling bad about them haven't helped you i pray that you meet the man of galilee i pray that you meet that man of galilee father may the entrance of your word bring light may the entrance of your word bring light into darkness in the name of jesus christ we pray amen oh hallelujah amen Amen. God bless Thank you. Thank you for listening to the sermons of Reverend Dr. Albert Agby. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Edify Church Life. Listen to more of his sermons on our Telegram at Edify Sermons and Edify Church Spotify platforms. Thanks for being a part of our Edify Church family. Be blessed by this word of God.